Good evening, everyone. I'm Andy Masick, uh, president of the Heinz History Center right here in beautiful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have a very special program for you tonight. It's part of the History Center's continuing series of history brought right to your home. But tonight's uh, evening is with a, an amazing Pittsburgh personality uh, and someone that is known internationally, uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht. We're gonna have a very special evening with Dr. Cyril Wecht. And what the occasion for this conversation is really the publication of a new book, uh, The Life and Deaths of Cyril Wecht, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist. Well, before we get into the program tonight, uh, we have uh, more than 200 people from around the country uh, who have registered for tonight's program. And these programs uh, done by Zoom, I think most of you are starting to get used to uh, this uh, distance learning and uh, remote education. But uh, just as a reminder, we are going to have a conversation led by Larry Richard, uh, who will be interviewing or moderating a conversation between uh, the author of the book, Jeff Seewald, and co-author Cyril Wecht. Uh, there will be a conversation between those three, and then there will be a uh, Q&A period at the end. We're trying to keep it to an hour. It may stretch a little beyond that. We'll see. But welcome, everyone, to our program tonight. Uh, we uh, believe there will be some closed captioning uh, available. Uh, there will be a, a chat feature that you or a question and answer feature that you can ask questions. Uh, those will be sorted by Mary Ruth Leftwich, uh, our director of learning at the History Center. She'll help get them to Larry Richard, who can then uh, pass them on to the uh, our panelists. Uh, you can add any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can check that out right now. Well, The Life and Deaths of Cyril Wecht, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist. It's authored by uh, Cyril Wecht, Dr. Wecht, and Jeff Seewald. Uh, it was published in uh, September of 2020. And it's available for purchase through the Heinz History Center online store. That's HeinzHistoryCenter.org. Check it out. Now, uh, let's start with Dr. Wecht, uh, Cyril Wecht, MD, JD. Uh, he's an internationally acclaimed forensic pathologist and attorney, a medical legal consultant who's become famous for consulting on deaths with high media profile. Uh, Dr. Weck is, is kind of like a magnet for controversy, uh, drawn to it like iron. Uh, his expertise has been called upon in cases involving John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Elvis Presley, John Benet Ramsey, Lacey Peterson, Kurt Cobain, the uh, fatal stabbings of the family of Dr. Jeffrey McDonald and O.J. Simpson's uh, uh, case uh, involving those slayings, the Waco Branch Davidians, uh, David Koresh, among others. Uh, Dr. Wecht has performed personally 21,000 autopsies. That's more people than I've even met in my life. He's done autopsies on them and he's uh, been involved in 41,000 uh, more. Uh, so we're going to learn a lot more about Dr. Wecht and his amazing career tonight. Now, his co-author on this book, uh, Jeff Seewald, is an award-winning writer and filmmaker who specializes in defining the cultural significance of people. He's a people person. Uh, and 
His films include Gridiron and Steel, uh, a documentary focusing on the almost spiritual relationship uh, that exists between uh, the sport of football and the people of southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, his other films uh, cover uh, everything from uh, jazz to his hometown of Pittsburgh. Well, in order to get us through this conversation, which is bound to be uh, interesting, I, I have to tell you, we've got Larry Richard with us tonight. And Larry is the voice of Pittsburgh. Um, if you don't know what he looks like, it's because he spent the last 20 years in radio. He started out in television. You, you'll, you'll be able to see he's got a face for television, but he's got the voice for radio. Uh, he's going to lead us through the conversation tonight. And Larry is, is special because he's smart, he's insightful, he's got a great sense of humor, and uh, he knows a good story when he hears one. So I'm going to fade away and turn things over to Larry Richard. Andy, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Uh, I appreciate it. And we can uh, all be enthusiastic and excited about tonight. First, I am a big fan of the Heinz History Center. So this is a special evening. And I've known Dr. Wecht and his work for many years, like most everybody knows his name. And I've been at KDK Radio for 33 years. And I believe I met Dr. Weck shortly after that in some interview encounter of some sort. And he is one of the most fascinating human beings, one of the most intellectually beyond anyone's comprehension and his vocabulary is unparalleled. So you will learn a lot tonight and I have the bonus of Jeff Seewald, who is an accomplished producer, writer, award-winning filmmaker, as Andy said, who is also uh, a graduate of North Allegheny High School here in the Pittsburgh area. That's my alma mater. And I met Jeff when he was brought in as a distinguished alumni. So here we go. Let's start, though, by asking Jeff, how in the world did you end up working with Dr. Weck to come up with this incredible book and how do you take all of what you must have heard and bring it into a tangible, readable format? Well, um, I, I met Cyril when, uh, he, of course I grew up here, so I remember Cyril from way back. Um, but I, uh, I was uh, commissioned to write a, an article for Pittsburgh Quarterly uh, profile of Cyril, and I went and met him, and I was shocked at how different he was from the way the local media had presented him for years. He was gracious, and he was uh, humble and patient, and um, so we did that article, and one day we were, he was very pleased with it, and um, we had lunch, and he was telling me stories about Pittsburgh and about his upbringing and everything. I said, you know, you really should write about this. And he said, looked at me and said, I don't have the time. How, who could help me with this? And I said, well, I could do it. And that was it. That's where it all started, right there. And Dr. Wecht, I know everybody joined in virtually tonight, is excited to hear from you. We'll never have enough time, but we will scratch enough of the surface. Uh, and I think a lot of people are wondering, who is Dr. Wecht? Where does he come from? How did this man, over 60 years, as Andy pointed out, be involved in 62,000 autopsies, whether personally or reviewing others? And so it was great to find out and learn in the book that your childhood, you had a great, strong family basis, right? Yes, uh, Larry. <clears throat> I want to start off by thanking uh, Andy and Mary Ruth for all their hard work there and, and decision to present this program. And of course, Larry, to you uh, for moderating it, uh, having you do this is extremely meaningful. And my deep appreciation, of course, to Jeff Seawall, 
without whom this book would not only have come to fruition, but would not have been uh, the book that has received such a wonderful reception. My uh, father was from Lithuania. My mother was from uh, Russia, Ukraine now, and uh, they met in America. I was an only child. My first year, uh, uh, they had their mom and pop store in Greene County, uh, Bobtown, near the West Virginia border, then seven years in McKees Rocks. And then when I was about eight years old, we moved to uh, the uh, Lower Hill District uptown, as we fashionably like to call it. I went to Forbes School, that big garage now, of Mercy Hospital that comes down to Forbes Avenue. Uh, that was where Forbes School was, and then Fifth Avenue High School, and then on to uh, Pitt. Um, so that's uh, my uh, quite humble background. My father always told me from the time I was uh, uh, in utero that I was going to be a doctor. Um, you know, if you were a little, uh, a little Jewish boy and your parents uh, came from overseas, they felt the best way to uh, be successful and uh, deal with anti-Semitism and be your own boss was to be a doctor, be a doctor, be a doctor. So I never thought otherwise. And then I went to Pitt and I became very active and a big man on campus uh, as president of the student body, uh, president of my fraternity. Um, I was uh, a concert master of the orchestra. Uh, and I was elected president of the YMCA <laughs> as a Jew, as president of the YMCA, um, and the vice president and a varsity debater and a business manager of Pitt Players. And then I had the lead role in Our Town, uh, that marvelous uh, Thornton Wilder play, which I'm sure all of you have seen. And um, I don't know, uh, I guess people thought I was pre-law. In any event, I went on to medical school and um, then... Um, I um, began to think about uh, uh, law a little bit. I applied for my residency in pathology and um, started there. And at the same time, um, <clears throat> applied for admission to law schools. I was very proud that I was accepted at both Harvard and Yale and offered scholarships. But I did my residency at the VA hospital in Pittsburgh and um, <clears throat> went to Pitt Law School full time at the same time. So I did that for two years. And then the Air Force grabbed me. I had been deferred. Uh, through college, and I went in and spent two years as a captain in the United States Air Force and, um, and got credit for those two years in pathology training, came out, and I needed my fifth year in forensic pathology and my last year of law school. I went to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, which had an excellent medical examiner's office and a good law school, University of Maryland, and I finished that year. And uh, along the way, in the Air Force in the second year, I met my lovely um, wife, uh, originally from uh, Norway, um, and Sigurd, and we got married that fall. So I finished that year at Baltimore, came back to Pittsburgh, and uh, that's been the story ever since. And we've been very fortunate at four great, wonderful children. Um, David is a Supreme Court Justice in Pennsylvania. Danny's a neurosurgeon. Uh, ben is in charge of the Institute of Forensic Science and Law at Duquesne University, named after me. And my daughter is an obstetrician gynecologist, and we have 11 uh, wonderful grandchildren. And I've uh, been working as a uh, I was a hospital pathologist for many years. I was chairman of the Department of Pathology um, at uh, St. Francis Central Hospital there in the Lower Hill. You remember that. Started off as Central Medical Pavilion and um, um, other hospitals and uh, started to do forensic pathology. And for 20 years, you'll remember this, Larry, so well because you covered me on many stories. I, I was coroner of Allegheny County, two separate 10-year periods, uh, 70 to 80, and then 96 to 06, and um, got involved in a lot of cases at that time, including some highly controversial ones, and you know, paid a price because of my controversiality. Uh, you remember that one lawsuit brought against me that was engineered by Kuhn uh, and uh, Colville, um, and I, I uh, went to court and whipped their ass there, and uh, then um, got uh, um, smashed with a, another big case, get it out there in the open, Mary Beth Buchanan, U.S. Attorney, looking to get herself a seat on the Third Circuit of Court of Appeals, um, um, instigated by a disgraced FBI agent named Orsini, who came here from New Jersey, um, and uh, promoted by uh, Steve Zappala, uh, with whom I've had extreme uh, enmity um, after a, a brief uh, friendship uh, early on, after he got appointed uh, District Attorney, uh, courtesy of his father who is chief justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And they brought in an 84 felony count indictment 
and whipped them on that. By the time we went to trial, after the indictment 43, before trial started, they withdrew 43 cases, um, charges, uh, which I had had to pay my attorneys to prepare for. And then we went to trial. We never put on one witness, and uh, it was a hung jury. And then it went up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and they said it had to be looked at by a new judge with fresh eyes, and that's what happened. And then they withdrew another 27 charges, and by that time, we we're down to 14 charges. The judge wrote a, a blistering 55-page report and threw the entire case out. Um, and uh, that finally went on from 2005 when they were starting their investigation. The trial started in 06, and everything wound up in 09. So that's the background. And during that time, by the way, I functioned as a forensic pathologist for uh, several counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, continued to do autopsies for um, Armstrong, Fayette, Green, and Westmoreland counties for the coroners and district attorneys, and uh, private autopsies uh, for people from all over the country, um, and sometimes from foreign countries. And then medical legal consultations for civil and criminal attorneys um, in all kinds of cases, um, homicide, rape, sexual assault, uh, drug cases, and on the civil side, medical malpractice, product liability, uh, wrongful death, and, and so on. And to uh, continue to teach at Duquesne University um, and uh, lecture, and I have faculty positions at uh, Carlo and University of Pittsburgh. So that's the background in hurried uh, fashion. Sorry to have taken so long, but I wanted to get it all out there and uh, people uh, can know about the background. It's, uh, it, it has always been, has not always been a bed of roses, but I've been so, so fortunate in having a strong, wonderful wife and great children. And uh, without that, I could not have, have done it. And I wanna say one more thing. I was way ahead of Donald Trump. You'll remember many months ago, Donald Trump came out and he made some derogatory remark about shithole countries sending their people here. And he said, why can't we have more people from countries like Norway? Well, I was way ahead of Donald Trump. I reached out to my Norwegian wife <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, so I accomplished something um, and made my contribution to America. Well, Dr. Wecht, as you know, and uh, Jeff, you got F. Lee Bailey, one of the most esteemed defense attorneys in the country said, quote, Cyril couldn't be intimidated if you faced him with a Sherman tank. And I think you just got a little taste of that right here. Jeff, when you interviewed Dr. Weck, what surprised you the most? What jumped out at you? Well, I mean, his energy level is, is phenomenal. I've never, in fact, one of the things that we is left unanswered in the book is neither of us could just figure out where that actually came from. I mean, he's got a he's got the energy level of somebody half his age, um, and the mental acuity, it, it, absolute you know recall of every detail of of cases that he worked on. But it was what was most interesting though is that Cyril opened up a whole world of uh, contacts of people that he uh, that he had worked with. I mean, when you get a chance to interview Oliver Stone and you get a chance to interview. Mark Garagos, and you get him at Effley Bailey and Alan Dershowitz. And I mean, I didn't hear one person say anything, but you know, he's, he's, the, he's the gold standard. He's the gold standard in forensic pathology. And Dershowitz said that even to this day. So that's, it was an exciting project and getting to know him, I got to know him. Uh, you see the energy that he has now. He just told you the whole book in uh, in, in in like three minutes, but uh, his his uh, his story is incredible. It's unusual and it was fun. And I would say, Jeff, uh, you did a wonderful job of kind of coagulating all of that uh, because this book could have been five times or more uh, in depth. But you had to pick out of twenty one thousand autopsies. No doubt, one that stands out, and you get this question all the time, Dr. Wecht, what's your most famous or interesting? But for the country, I think overall, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and you've been out front on this, and that's how you met Oliver Stone for a long time, it still haunts many people to this day. And that's no question, Larry. you on the map. 
not only Larry, because it was the president, but believe me, and I just had this conversation uh, last evening with my longtime friend and colleague, Michael Bodden, um, and we were talking. Um, and you know, from a forensic scientific standpoint, even if this were Joe Jones, of course, you wouldn't know about it if it were Joe Jones, but because it was President Kennedy, from a forensic scientific standpoint, it is the most perplexing and vexatious gay, a case that I've been involved in because of the way in which it was handled. Um, spiriting the body out of Dallas to begin with, um, taking it away from the medical examiner who should have done the autopsy there, going to Washington, D.C., the autopsy done at Bethesda Naval Hospital by, and I want, I want the viewers, listeners, very carefully, listen to my words. An autopsy, President of the United States of America, multiple gunshot wounds, you have to determine entrance, exit, angle, range, trajectory, sequence. You have to correlate those wounds with the multiple gunshot wounds in John Conley. That is a formidable task that two or three top-notch forensic pathologists working together would spend hours on. This autopsy in this great country of ours was done by two naval career pathologists, Humes and Boswell by name, at Bethesda Naval Hospital who had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Unbelievable. Their findings are vastly different from what was observed by 18 doctors and many nurses down there at Parkland Memorial Hospital who worked feverishly on the president for half an hour. And these good old boy Texans just calling it as what they saw and what they, what they observed and did. And then we have findings which are absolutely different. And then uh, we have the brain that winds up missing, which I disclosed when I was uh, finally given access to the autopsy materials in 1972. And Fred Graham of the New York Times had the exclusive story on that. Page one, August 24th, 1972, president's brain missing. They never dissected the brain after it had been fixed in formalin to give it a harder consistency. Why? Because it would have shown that there were two separate hemorrhagic tracks that Kennedy was struck in the head twice. Yes, indeed, Larry, I remain very active. I'm president of a national group, Kappa, Committee Against Political Assassinations. We have formidable programs every year in November. We'll have one um, this fall and so on, and continue to work with some of the top-notch Warren Commission critic researchers. Uh, yes, it indeed is the number one case. And then I've had the opportunity to be consulted in the Senator Robert F. Kennedy case, the Mary Jo Kopechny involving Ted Kennedy, and then all the cases and many others that Andy has referred to. Um, a, a lot more, um, uh, Tammy, Tammy Wynette and um, Chandra Levy and Phil Spector, uh, on and on. Uh, so that's, that's the story. Dr. Wecht, uh, part of the, the enjoyment of reading this book is also as you discussed your background in childhood, and I think a lot of people will be surprised to know that uh, you went to law school uh, first and you were an athlete, you played basketball and you were, as you mentioned, uh, an, an actor and performer in, in the music world. And the diversity is, is what may be really surprising. I mean, you're so laser focused on the forensic part and people may be surprised as you mentioned, you were a captain in the United States Air Force and served this country in that manner. What was it that intrigued you to change your career and then lock in laser focused on forensic pathology that keeps you engaged to this day? I began to think of the interface of law and medicine and finally was directed to the top person in that field by the AMA. I went and met with him in New York City and got a straight story because up until then, I was told by some people, you'll be neither fish nor fowl and by others that you'll be a multimillionaire overnight. So he set me straight and I made that decision. And then as I began to look into it, I realized that the area of medical specialization that is most meaningfully and frequently involved at the interface of law and medicine is forensic pathology. Look what we do, the cases that we deal with, violence, sudden, suspicious, unexpected, unexplained, medically unattended deaths, and known, alleged, suspected, homicide, accident, suicide. Uh, I'll be doing an autopsy tomorrow on a, uh, um, a Chinese young man um, uh, who died. Uh, they, they signed him out as a hanging here, and the parents are very unhappy about that. 
uh, and I got they got me on the phone uh, through an attorney here in New York City and um, speaking with them, and she was the interpreter. And so I'll be doing uh, that autopsy on that young Chinese graduate student uh, there uh, from China. Uh, he was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, this is it. Uh, attorneys reach out to me on all kinds of cases, and some are very fascinating cases which, you know, people have never heard about. And I've, I've talked about them in some of my other books. Uh, uh, and you know, they're very, very uh, interesting, and many have been on television programs. Uh, there's a case right now going on that everybody is aware of. I did two, two Zoom interviews today that will be shown next week on national television programs dealing with the George Floyd death and the trial of a police officer, former police officer, Derek Chauvin in Hennepin County, Minneapolis. So stay tuned for those. It's a very, very a dramatic case. And then, of course, uh, Jeffrey Epstein uh, recently, um, um, my colleague attended that autopsy, Dr. Michael Vaden, and he called me um, a couple of days thereafter. We've been talking and dealing with that case, and I've been interviewed on that for um, several uh, several occasions. And, you know, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, um, I, I love these cases. They're challenging, and they do lead to um, controversiality. I don't go out seeking it, uh, but obviously, if you become involved in those cases, um, then, and if you testify against a, a fellow um, medical examiner who's done a case like Rebecca Zehau, the beautiful um, Asian woman who was found hanging from the balcony of her multimillionaire boyfriend, Shackney, out in San Diego at Spreckles Mansion, uh, and calves bound tightly, wrists tied tightly behind her back, a, a rope around her neck, uh, a T-shirt stuffed into her mouth, and they signed it out as a suicide. And she was bare ass naked. Women do not commit suicide naked, I can tell you that. I can't even remember ever such a case. Uh, it is so rare. And so I testified and uh, in a civil case then, because they wouldn't bring criminal charges, and the jury came in with a $5.2 million verdict in three, four hours. So that makes you controversial. I'm so proud of that, I can't tell you. Or a case I testified in Washington State early last year, just before the whole COVID thing broke loose, uh, two uh, little boys, um, uh, two and four years old, who were brutally, brutally murdered by uh, their father, divorced from their mother. She had gone missing, and yet the authorities allowed those kids to be taken uh, to their divorced father, who had never answered as to what happened to his wife. And I explained how they had conscious pain and suffering. And a jury came in with a verdict of $114 million. Um, and so something like that is thrilling, exciting, meaningful, and, 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 and is so valuable emotionally, psychologically, financially, whatever, to families and people. And I, I just feel wonderful about that. Dr. Wecht, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, because he's one of the more recent, if you go back from the beginning of your career, um, there are so many high, high profile people attached to him, even to a commoner like me, who's just watching the news. It seemed very suspicious that this man died of suicide, incarcerated. Uh, before we move on, do you believe that there were others involved to silence him because he could have really opened the eyes and uh, the information on some very prominent people. I very strongly believe as a forensic pathologist that Jeffrey <clears throat> Epstein um, uh, was strangled, a ligature strangulation. He had three fractures, Larry, the hyoid bone uh, way up here high underneath the chin, the base of which is directed anteriorly, and then the thyroid cartilage, Adam's apple, a fracture of the hyoid bone and bilateral fractures of the thyroid cartilage. You do not get those in a lean into hanging, which is what happened with him. Uh, you don't get that at all. Uh, no question about it. Uh, Dr. Bodden was there and he reviewed it, called me. Um, I remember we talked about it and we've discussed it uh, many times and I have reviewed everything there. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein was silenced and as you as you said, referring to people, a prince here and the next uh, president of a country there and so on. Well, <clears throat> we shall see, Larry, what emerges 
when Ghislaine Maxwell comes to trial sometime later this year, um, what she has to say about these people. I'm involved in that case now too, indirectly. I have been contacted by the attorneys who are representing one of the women and her sister um, who <clears throat> were abused by Epstein, Maria Farmer by name, I'm permitted to say that. Uh, and I have reviewed her medical records and so on. And so uh, I'll become now uh, tangentially uh, involved in that case from the, from the wrongful death side, tied in with the evaluation of it uh, from the standpoint of what caused his death. How do you separate yourself? Because we've mentioned the number of autopsies. That's staggering just from a physiological count of 60 years of work but how do you separate that these were human beings with families and friends and wives and children and and the humanity of that and and not have that affect you or or does it and how do you deal with it i am always mindful larry of every case i do that that is a human being and no matter who he or she was that he or she was loved by somebody and obviously it's um, more more emotionally traumatic if you're dealing with a child or you're dealing with someone who has been brutally uh, murdered um, and and so on or in some kind of a horrible uh, accidental situation and so on uh, so I never you know completely separate myself but uh, in terms of the work you have to deal with it objectively and you just have to let yourself um, in order to maintain your credibility and uh, to be sought after by attorneys and to have credibility uh, for uh, juries and judges in subsequent trials and so on, uh, you try to maintain your role as a forensic scientist, that you are not there for the prosecution, uh, which many medical examiners fail to keep in mind. You are not an arm of the prosecution. You're supposed to be a neutral forensic scientist. And I keep that in mind, Larry. And at the same time, I am mindful uh, in a personal way of uh, some life having been taken and other lives uh, that can be affected too in other ways. Someone who was wrongly accused, someone who has been wrongly convicted and uh, uh, sometimes a, a murder which has not been fully appreciated. So uh, you, you know, that's the nature of, of the work. And uh, it, is, it is intellectually challenging and always something new and different. You think you've seen it all and boy, <laughs> you haven't. 30 years ago, I sat at KDK TV, which is a CBS affiliate for those who are out of town, and they were showing the new programs, and one of those was CSI, and somebody in the room said, who's going to watch a show about, you know, forensic pathology, <laughs> and, and look at the proliferation of those programs since because of the, the intrigue, and people want to know and find the truth. That's right. And Larry, when you went to college and, and Jeff and Andy and Mary Ruth and all of us on a program and so on, um, I'll bet you there were no forensic science programs in your universities or colleges. Absolutely not. Today, hundreds of universities and colleges have forensic science programs. The fascination with forensic science is incredible. And uh, what has happened in the academic world is truly incredible no no subject matter has um had the impact and the universal appeal that we find and by the way i think the program that preceded csi was what quincy it wasn't quincy right. the run. yeah and then remember and then sir we had, a, we had a chapter in the book at one point called uh i was um i was quincy before before Jack Klugman, <laughs> who, by the way, went to Carnegie Mellon University, I believe. Yes, yes I did. think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Jeff, after working with Dr. Weck, you, you have to be thinking about we have to do more because you can only cover so much uh, in, in this first book, in this first memoir. Are you planning to uh, do a follow up or maybe a documentary? Well, there's some plans uh, plans in the works now. We're talking to some people about uh, a documentary and also a podcast and uh, possibly even a dramatic television program out of, uh, Cal out of California of, of Cyril's life. And imagine a multi-part uh, multi uh, drama 
for uh, streaming. Um, so all those things are being talked about right as we speak. The most Not difficult, cool. challenging problem there, Larry, is um, that we still have to find a way to exhume Paul Newman and yeah. get him revitalized. <laughs> that's our that's our hang up. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Although uh, we want to get to our audience questions, and, and that's a good transition, Dr. Weck, because uh, Terry Mellis asks, what was, was your portrayal in the movie Concussion essentially accurate? And there was an actor playing you. So did you- Oh boy, I could talk about that, Larry, after Cyril does. Okay. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jeff, why don't you? Well, the thing is, I remember calling Cyril after I saw the film and I said, but that wasn't you. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't Cyril. What, they were meeting at a bar and I've never seen Cyril at a bar ever. And also he never talked to Cyril. He never wanted to talk to Cyril um, to get the, you know, the characterization correct. Um, but uh, that was a problem yeah. for me. How about you? Yes, I, I agree. Albert Brook is a marvelous actor. I wish that he could have, you know, just learned a little bit more. Of course, the movie wasn't about me. Um, I was just a, a, a tangential figure. The figure was about um, Dr. Omalu, who came up with the chronic traumatic encephalopathy business, although it happened while I was coroner, and I encouraged him and worked with him and got him started with the Mike Webster case. But um, yes, um, there I am sitting at a bar, I don't drink, I, not that I'm offended, and there I am standing by this fancy expensive car, <laughs> which I've never had. Um, I drive cars that have to be at least 10 years old the way I drive, and I don't give a damn about bumps and scratches <laughs> and things like that. Fancy cars don't mean anything to me. And then uh, the portrayal of me and my character uh, and so on. And they come up with the idea that uh, the lawsuit brought against me by the feds had to do with... Uh, that movie and my coming out about football and so on, which is totally, totally absurd, had not a damn thing to do uh, with uh, um, our findings uh, with regard uh, to uh, CTE. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's too bad. Um, and um, uh, well, so anyway, that's- you got, that's you got dinner with Alec Baldwin out of it, right? Oh yeah, Alec Baldwin. We spent a wonderful two and a half hour dinner over in the South Side and uh, had nothing to do with the movie. Ali Baldwin is very much into the JFK assassination. And he and I maintain this friendship and correspondence ever since uh, he came to one of our national programs and on his own ticket and, and spoke at our dinner uh, at one of those November programs. And um, um, yes, he, he is very much involved in, in JFK and I'm proud to have him as a friend. Um, and um, you know, other people, um, who are involved too. I just wrote a blurb for F. Lee Bailey's new book, which will be coming out in a few months, The Truth <clears throat> About the O.J. Simpson Trial. And that'll be a fascinating read too. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure meeting with these people and working with them and Oliver Stone too. Um, he's been here and I remember he's a guest at our home uh, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been delightful uh, to to meet these people and to uh, talk with them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, you know, there's a reason why they are such great individuals. The book is The Life and Deaths of Cyril Weck, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist. We have about 200 people uh, viewing online, and we're appreciative of your time and interest. And let's get to a really practical question, doctor, from Rebecca. What would you suggest as the first step for a young person who is interested in the forensic science field? Um, <clears throat> look around and find out what colleges have programs. Right here in Pittsburgh at Duquesne University, for example, there's a five-year entry-level program leading to a master's degree in forensic science. Um, and there are you know, forensic science programs, excellent programs in universities all over the country from coast to coast. So you know, pick a place where you want to go and, uh, and then do well. And, um, and then think of it as the beginning, not the end, but the beginning. Think of it as a door opener uh, to go on and get a PhD. If you want to be a scientist in one of the fields, think about it as a pre-med course uh, for medical school. Think about it as pre-law course for law school and so on. 
That's what you got to do. And along the way, make darn sure that you get good grades so you can be accepted into these programs. They're highly competitive. And of course, getting into medical school is extremely difficult. The competition is tough. So uh, take it step by step. Think about good grades. Look and see where there are programs. Do well and, and plan to move on. Don't just settle for your uh, BS uh, degree or your BA degree. Uh, don't settle even for the master's. Think about either MD, JD, or PhD, and so that you'll have more doors open for you in the field. And then you'll see what specialty you want to get into. There's, you know, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, for example, has about 10 uh, different subsections, pathology, um, psychiatry, criminalistics, entomology, odontology, uh, nursing, um, uh, you know, all of these different subspecialties. You'll see uh, what you what you like. Beth French asks, and how about this, Doc? Hola, Dr. Weck from Buenos Aires. Can you think of a case you gave testimony that had a verdict you felt went against the obvious forensic evidence? Well, Buenos Aires, well, let me tell you about a case that I have from Buenos Aires uh, in which um, I was interviewed and my testimony played a big role in getting the case opened and labeled for what it was. This was the man Niesman, who was going to be testifying on the bombing at the Jewish Center down there. And uh, it was found conveniently dead the very morning that he was to testify in. And they signed it out as a suicide. Television came up from Buenos Aires, interviewed me, and I explained why it was not a suicide, it was a homicide. And the case was eventually then ruled as a homicide by the official authorities in Argentina. Um, and so there's a perfect example for that listener, viewer from Argentina. Look into the Niesman case. Sarah Windish wants to know, Dr. Weck, you've done such a wonderful job making forensics interesting to the public and have been on many TV shows. Given your family is here, did you ever otherwise ever consider leaving Pittsburgh permanently? Yes, I did on occasion. Uh, there were some top medical examiner positions open, Cook County, um, Suffolk County, uh, New York, and, and so on. Um, but and then New York City office uh, too. But uh, my parents were here um, and I had a very close relationship with them. And I've always liked Pittsburgh and Pittsburghers, and I've been comfortable here. It's a nice, yeah, big, um, <clears throat> a small city or a small, big city, <laughs> any way you want to label it. But I'm comfortable here and uh, never really pursued anything beyond thinking about it uh, in transient fashion. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that I made that decision uh, to uh, stay here. Joan wants to know, what was the most difficult case you've ever had? Well, I mean, a lot of very difficult cases. And, you know, I haven't always prevailed. Uh, nothing magic. Uh, I, uh, I've had cases. It's hard to say, you know, the most difficult. Um, there are some cases that bother me today. Do I have the full answer? Am I certain? Am I certain that Jeffrey McDonald, uh, the uh, captain medical doctor, uh, did or did not kill uh, his wife and two beautiful little girls? Um, you know, I was consulted in that case uh, too, and uh, it's it's a tough case. Um, another tough case um, is the Phil Spector case. Did he or did he not intentionally mean to kill that young woman at his place, or was he just uh, showing off with a gun, uh, which he did on occasion, and was it an accident? He just died recently after spending all those years or while he was still in prison. So there are cases that are not clear cut. Let me make a point, if I may, that no field of medicine is an absolute science. Only cellular DNA is an absolute science. Uh, even pathology, where we have the opportunity, not because we're more brilliant than surgeons and internists and others, but because we have the opportunity then to see the patient, uh, hold uh, his, her organs uh, in our hand and so on, that still doesn't make it an absolute science. So there can be differences of opinion. And I recognize that. And I don't give testimony with absolute certainty. I, I hate that when one of my colleagues does that and they're not supposed to do that. You give your testimony, quote, with a reasonable degree of medical certainty, a reasonable degree of medical or forensic scientific probability. That means, you know, literally 51% or better. 
um, insofar as your testimony is concerned. Now, in a homicide case, the jury has to find the person uh, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, whatever that means, 99%, 96%, who knows. Um, in a civil case, uh, probable versus possible, uh, does that mean just 51%? But uh, I want to make that clear. And I don't think just because I render an opinion that I am absolutely right and there cannot be any other answer. I try to give my opinions, for example, now in the George Floyd case with Derek Chauvin explaining why um, George Floyd did not die from fentanyl, which is gonna be the big defense up there that he had a high level of fentanyl, which he did, but I explained why and don't have time to do it now. Uh, he did not die from fentanyl and he died from the compression placed on his neck uh, and back by Chauvin and other police officers. So you give your explanation in a credible way and you hope that you get the points across to the jury. We have a question from Teo Neuendorfer. Do you keep any souvenirs from any cases? Pardon me? Do you keep any souvenirs? Oh, do I keep any souvenirs? Um, <laughs> no, 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 uh, no particular, I'm not, uh, no, I not in the souvenirs. And in fact, you know, in the old days, uh, a couple of generations before me, they used to keep uh, souvenirs, biological specimens, um, something atypical, something different, and so on. In fact, I just turned down a case from New Jersey. Uh, the family wants to sue because um, their child uh, had the brain taken and examined uh, by a children's hospital uh, a couple of weeks later, and the family had not been told that the brain was being held back. Um, so, um, you know, you, 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 you just have to deal with all cases in a, as I say, I repeat, in a, in a credible way um, and think of uh, people's uh, feelings, but how they relate to law. Amanda Doty wants to know, how did you become confident in finding a career that essentially didn't exist at the time until you started? Well, um, thank you very much. That's a hell of a compliment, but no, I did not start it. Forensic pathology started a couple thousand years ago. Just think of those wonderful societies that have um, existed on this planet Earth, uh, Greek and Roman uh, and Hebrew and Chinese and what have you. Do you think that in those societies, when they found somebody with his head bashed in, or they found a body floating in the water, or they found a newborn child, that they said, oh, who cares, who cares? No, they thought about it. Now, they didn't know the phrase forensic pathology. They weren't into autopsies um, and, and so on. But they knew that those cases had to be investigated. And then you go through the centuries that followed, and you'll see references to this in the religious tractates of all the great religions and so on. And then in the um, in 12th century, the Chinese put out a magnificent book uh, in, in English called The Writing of Wrongs, in which they dealt with cases. And then three uh, centuries later, the great uh, physician uh, Zacchaeus in Rome, the Institute of Legal Medicine, and I had the opportunity to see that original book, Questiones de Medicina Legal, in which he posed questions to himself and then he addressed them. Just the same kinds of questions that we deal with today. So a magnificent compliment. I thank that person um, and give her uh, a kiss on both cheeks. But no, I, I did not found forensic pathology. I would hope that maybe I've contributed a little bit to it in modern times, but it has been around because of that need to find out why somebody died suddenly, unexpectedly, um, without medical attention, um, uh, something of violence or so on, to determine for whatever reasons, um, those questions have been dealt with by every civilization that has been on this planet Earth. Ellen Smith wants to know, will CTE be prevented by better helmets or do we just have to stop playing full contact football? I think it will not be prevented. I think it will be significantly diminished. Um, and of course, technology is always advancing. But, you know, and I, you know, I played football in high school and then um, in college, we, that was just a two-hand touch football in a fraternity. But um, <clears throat> football is a, is a rough game. And when you look at it, Larry, and you see these 250, 300-pound people and they're running at a high speed, 
you know, keep in mind your high school equation of force equals one half mass times velocity squared. You have somebody who is running what uh, four miles an hour, whatever the speed is for a short distance, and uh, the size of that body crashing into another human being. No, uh, it's a barbaric sport. I, I think every family has to decide for themselves. And we had to make that decision. Our boys wanted to play football, um, and they did. And um, and um, our daughter uh, lacrosse, uh, which is uh, um, and uh, and um, uh, field soccer and so on. Uh, those are tough sports. Um, so you have to make a decision with your kids and your grandchildren uh, um, whether you want them to play or not. Uh, whether or not, in some centuries down the road, they will look back on football, like pro football or college football for that matter too, the way we look back on some of the things that the Roman gladiators and others did uh, as being barbaric, uh, who knows? You, had, you, you allowed uh, your children, you, you went uh, uh, tens of, of thousands of people to see individuals maul each, maul each other in that fashion. And very interesting, very interesting because we don't have that in baseball or basketball or tennis or golf, uh, do we? But we do have it also in, in soccer and we do have it certainly in hockey. So these, these are things that are here, how long they are here and whether civilization will uh, frown upon that in future years and we can only conjecture. Kimberly Riley wants to know, you consulted on the case of a Duquesne University student that drowned a few years ago that appeared on an A&E special in the Smiley Face Killers. Has there been any progress made regarding that investigation? Yes, I was contacted by a reti retired homicide detective from New York City. Um, and um, <clears throat> he uh, came, visited with me a few times in Pittsburgh and um, looked into that case of the Duquesne student, as well as cases elsewhere around the country. And they came up with the appellation of, smile, uh, of a smiley face killer because someone made the picture you know, of a smiley face. I review it again, each case separately, did not just make an assumption to start off with. And they all involved, <gasps> excuse me, a young adult, white males, um, no suicidal ideation, no drugs, um, the Duquesne student case, for example, young man, um, <clears throat> uh, he was seen at a bar on the south side, crossed over the river, seen at a bar here, last picked up by a street camera at the corner of 7th Street and Penn Avenue, and he lived over in the north side. So now we have him walking to his home. He crosses over one of the bridges, 6th or 7th Street Bridge, um, and the way the police and the medical examiner's office uh, handled the case and signed it off, they have you believe that this guy having to urinate is past midnight on a very, very cold night. Uh, he was so discreet, what a gentleman, that not only would he not urinate uh, out in the street between a parked car or against a building, not even would he just go off to the side, but he walked all the way down to the river's edge, Larry, the river's edge, uh, to, to urinate. And then somehow he slipped and fell and into the river. Uh, so you believe that? Um, sure. Um, no way. So I think that that was a homicide. Um, now, whether these cases are connected, I don't believe that they're the same people. I do believe that there is a real likelihood for some copycat killings in these cases. The fact that they all involve um, white males in their late teens, early 20s, um, cases in which there's no explanation in terms of um, suicide, no expressions of suicidal ideation, uh, cases in which they had no financial problems, no romantic problems, no academic problems, and so on. And then all of a sudden, they wind up in a river or a lake and so on. Um, no, I, I think that there is a connection in terms of the <clears throat> psychological background of the people and how uh, those circumstances came into play for those individual uh, tragedies. Dick Jones wants to know, what is your bottom line opinion of the Jean Benet Ramsey case? My bottom line opinion is there was no outside intruder, um, uh, no outside intruder. 
The outside intruder theory is absurd. Somebody comes into the house in the middle of the night without awakening anybody. He knows where the little girl's bedroom is. He is able to get her out of the room without awakening her or causing any disturbance. Her brother, three years older, Burke, right next door, without awakening him. He knows about a back set of stairs that leads into the basement. And he knows about a room um, where he goes with the little girl, a room that was so obscure, Larry, so obscure that the homicide detectives called to the house at 6.30 in the morning on December 26, looking for the body of a little girl, never even knew the room existed. It wasn't until one o'clock, about six, seven hours later, that John Ramsey said to his then best friend who became his worst enemy, Fleet White, another multimillionaire businessman, hey, let's go look again. He goes down to the basement, takes Fleet White, opens up this door, and before, according to Fleet White, one's eyes could become adjusted to the light switch turned on. He exclaims, oh, my God, there she is. And there was the little girl beneath the blanket. So then what does the autopsy reveal? The autopsy reveals um, chronic inflammation of the vaginal mucosa, delicate lining of the interior of the vagina. It reveals uh, superficial erosion at the 7 o'clock position. Ask uh, your wife or any woman who's been to the gynecologist. There's the right-handed um, examiner using the index finger to see if there are any lesions inside the posterior uh, cervical um, region, um, the back of the vagina, and so on. Um, focal superficial erosion there under um, blue prism light, a special light we use on a camera. Um, they found by refringent material the co most common source of which in your household and mine and most Americans is talcum powder. Put that all together and see what you think. There was no evidence of any penile penetration, no spermatozoa or seminal fluid, but these findings. Then we have an eight and a half inch fracture of the skull from the front all the way to the rear. And with that kind of a fracture, Larry, somebody came in and cracked your head or mine with or without our hair or so on, eight and a half, you're not going to die right away because the part of the brain that controls respiratory and cardiac function is located posteriorly at the base of the brain. Um, and that's where the respiratory and cardiac centers are located. So you get a fracture and you're going to bleed and then you're going to die from the um, accumulation of blood compressing the brain and pushing down on those centers because fluid looks for an escape. The only escape hole is the foramen magnum, a large opening at the base of the skull in the rear through which the spinal cord emerges. So uh, how much blood was present in John Benet Ramsey with an eight and a half inch fracture? Seven or eight cc's. That's a teaspoon and a half. That blow was inflicted when the little girl was dead or dying. So now we have our intruder and then he wants to write a ransom note. He says, you know what? I've had a pleasurable time here. Um, I'm, I'm going to make some money too. Um, oh, damn, I forgot to bring pen and paper. Hey, I'll, no, no problem. In the middle of the night, he, I'll find pen and paper. He goes and he finds pen and paper, uh, uh, Ramsey's, and he begins to write a note. Doesn't like the beginning, crumbles it, throws it to the floor. He knows one day it's going to be an important piece of evidence. And then he writes, we represent a small foreign faction. And what was the ransom demand? $119,000. You like that number? Nice round figure, which is exactly what Ramsey made as a bonus from his company the year before. How many people do you think knew that? $118,000, I think was the exact amount. $118,000. And then he does all of that. This horrible monster, but pretty cunning and, and daring to have accomplished everything that I've told you about, to have known all of these things and to have gotten away with everything. He makes one mistake, Larry, one mistake. You know what it was, Larry? What was that? He forgot to take the body. You forgot to take the body. You just wrote the goddamn ransom note. 45 pound package. You take the little girl, you throw her in the back of your car, into the woods, down a sewer, into a river, whatever you do, you do all of that. And then you leave the body after having written the ransom note? No. Um, John Benet Ramsey's uh, death was directly attributable to somebody in that household, and I think it was the father. I do not believe that it was Burke, the brother. Too much uh, had to have been done. And the whole thing was a farce. They said the little girl was put to bed right away when they returned from visiting their friends that day uh, in her uh, the beginning of the intestine, just outside the stomach, was found a piece of pineapple, her favorite food. 
There was no pineapple present in any of the homes they visited. That pineapple was present in their home. It wasn't from the morning that she left because it doesn't take a food uh, 12, 14 hours uh, to pass on through um, beyond the stomach and the duodenum, the beginning of the small intestine. That pineapple was eaten when she came home. Uh, the whole thing uh, was a lie. It was never pursued. The Boulder police had no experience in homicide investigation. That was the only murder case, I think, that year in Boulder. And one case the year before, Alex Hunter, who was the district attorney, he had a plea bargain rate of 98 to 99 percent. 98 to 99 percent of cases that came before him, he plea bargained away, never went to trial. So um, put it all together. And then you have the, the dramatic story, the tragic saga of John Benet Ramsey. And I have a book on that, Who Killed John Benet Ramsey. You want all the details, you want to read the autopsy report yourself uh, and a judge's decision too about some aspect of it, get it, Who Killed John Benet Ramsey with Charles Bosworth, an excellent writer from St. Louis. Uh, we wrote that book together. I have to smile at this question. Saturday is, as you're well aware, your 90th birthday. And Glenn Kiernan says, Happy birthday, and we all say happy birthday to you, Dr. Weck. Any plans to retire? Can I answer that? I think no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, 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 you're right, Larry. I, I uh, have no plans to retire because I don't know what I would do with myself. I'm so sorry that I stopped uh, playing the violin. I was an accomplished violinist. I played every one of the concertos by memory, Beethoven and Bach and La Lo Symphonie Espagnole and, uh, and Mozart and, and, and so on. And I, I stopped playing, it was so stupid of me, but I, I don't know what I would do if I uh, retire. Um, so I have no plans to retire. Uh, I'm continuing uh, with my consultations and my autopsies and teaching my course at Duquesne and writing and uh, Maybe we'll get busy with Jeff, as you have suggested, and write a, a sequel uh, to uh, this book. There's a lot of things that I want to include in the next book, including, by the way, talking about the violin, a marvelous picture, which my grandson just found in, in his parents' collection of me playing the violin. At that time, my son David was living with us for a while. He had just come back from Washington, and, and he and two of his kids had been born at that time. Uh, and they're sitting, they're, they're standing there, these two little kids watching me play the violin. I was trying to get them interested in becoming <laughs> a violinist. Well, Dr. Wecht, uh, it, it's been a fascinating hour. And I, I do want Jacqueline Bala's question, so we could squeeze this in, and then we'll give Jeff a chance for kind of some final thoughts, too. Does your wife and family find your work as fascinating as you do? And is there a rule in the family that at some points you can't talk about your work? Um, I guess they're probably sometimes maybe a little sick and tired of um, uh, hearing me repeat some things. <laughs> um, and uh, what is very troubling is that all of my jokes have been told so many times, I can't even um, get around to my jokes anymore with them. But no, they're, they're, they're very interested. My wife is a lawyer um, and also has a graduate degree in public international affairs from Gisby at Pitt. Um, and she um, <clears throat> is in my office and runs uh, the office. Um, so, you know, we, we go in every day and I don't know what we would do. Uh, so we're gonna ha have no plans yet to retire. And we're fortunate that my four kids um, and their wonderful spouses uh, and the 11 grandchildren are here in Pittsburgh. Of course, some of the children are away at college and medical school and law school now too, but uh, having them here um, is what keeps me going. So uh, I look forward to other programs like this, Larry with you and uh, Andy, I hope uh, <clears throat> and Mary Ruth will have us back at uh, Heinz History Center again down the road um, and for uh, what the 95th um, or so on. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. The book is The Life and Deaths of Cyril Weck, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist, one of the hardest working and most intelligent human beings, the most intelligent I've ever met. And I want everyone to know, Dr. Weck, you're the busiest person, but yet you have time for the arts. And I want them to know that you take the time to handwrite notes to people like me when I was a young broadcaster 
And I don't think you realize what that meant to me and all the people that I know that you have sent kind notes to over the years. Who has time for that? Dr. Cyril Weck. So I want to thank uh, Jim Seawald, a producer, writer, director, award-winning filmmaker. Jeff, final thought from you, and we'll get one more thought from Dr. Weck, and uh, we'll wish everyone a good weekend. Well, one thing you have, to, you have to remember about Cyril is uh, one thing that impressed me is that he had four children. They all went to a prestigious uh, universities elsewhere, and yet they all came back home. I don't know a, a family that's a, that's a, uh, that isn't a great family that that happens to. Um, and so he's surrounded by these uh, members of his family, and that's largely what keeps him keeps him going and keeps him stable. That's what I think. Well, Jeff, uh, we applaud you and your work and we'll look forward to the documentary. You got to make that happen too. Oh yeah. And, well, we're working on it. So. All right, partner. And uh, again, Dr. Weck, from all of us, happy birthday and give our best to your wife. You may have seen her for a moment or two early in our discussion. Uh, it's been an amazing hour and we want to do it again soon. So Larry, thank I you. thank you. You've been wonderful as always, uh, an old friend and one of uh, the most respected news media people that I've dealt with over these past three, four decades uh, in Allegheny County. You are always fair and knowledgeable and prepared um, and a pleasure to deal with. And uh, your, your handling of the case of the program tonight meant this so much. And again, my, my thanks so much to Andy Masick and uh, Mary Ruth uh, um, Lethwich um, for doing this. And I hope that we can do it again. So on behalf of the Heinz History Center, Andy Masick and Dr. Lepwich, we thank you. Dr. Cyril Weck, Jeff Seawald, continued success. Everybody stay safe, and we hope to uh, see you maybe in person sometime soon. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Good night. sir.